Hey guys, I just wanted to do something a little different this week and post a quick video update for you. Um, Badass of the Week turned 12 last month. I don't know if you can believe that or not. I can't even, I feel like I was in high school 12 years ago, but apparently I've been doing this for 12 years. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not pushing myself the way that I should. Uh, and so I'm going to try to change that today. Uh, I think that you know, I'm at the spot where a lot of people who are in the situation I am would, would try to do something, you know, maybe just let it let it die, let it fall by the wayside. I'm not interested in that. I'm going to keep reading history until I die. I'm not going to ever give up on that. Uh, so I think that it's time for me to do something new and um, different and completely fucking terrifying. So with that in mind, my name is Ben Thompson, and this is your Badass of the Week for May 16, 2016. Before you say anything about that intro, just know it took me like a week to put that together and it's going to be a learning experience as I go, like if I keep going. I'm fairly confident I'm going to have a couple dozen YouTube comments that are going to completely discourage me from ever wanting to try anything like this again, but there you have it. Today I'm going to be talking about Edward Longshanks, Edward I of England. A lot of people know him as the Hammer of the Scots, but he's a whole lot more than that. He was actually the hammer of anybody that fucked with him, right? In his like 40 years of ruling England, he beat the shit out of the Welsh, the Scots, rebel Englishmen, uh, the Jews hate him, he was a crusader in the Middle East, like while he was over there, and this is like before he was even the king, he was over in the Middle East, uh, some uh, Arab assassin broke into his tent in the middle of the night, shanked him with a poison dagger, no pun intended, I guess. Uh, he wakes up, takes the knife away from the guy, kills him with his own knife, then his wife sucks the poison out of his wound, because his wife's badass also. Okay, this guy is awesome. His last words on his deathbed were to um, take my body and strap it to a chair and lead it out the front of our armies so that uh, it would terrify our enemies and inspire our men to like great deeds. Oh, and here's another cool thing about Edward Longshanks. If you're like me or like the, what, the five and a half billion other people on this planet who are super into Game of Thrones right now, you probably heard that it's based on the, uh, you know, the War of the Roses from England. Well, that's not entirely true. It's kind of just a mishmash of all these different characters from English, like, medieval history. Uh, for me personally, I have a soft spot for, you know, Cal Drogo, Sir Pounce, but I love Tywin Lannister. I know a lot of people hate him, but for me, like, he's a guy that plays the Game of Thrones in a manner that's not too dissimilar from the way I play medieval Total War II, right? It's all about, like, ruthlessly executing the prisoners, you sack all the settlements, you, like, beat the shit out of every motherfucker that gets in your way. And, uh, Tywin is based, like, very, very closely off the life of Edward I. So, let's talk about that. Eddie was born in June of 1239. He was the eldest son of King Henry III of England, who was a pretty weak king, but he was a really pious guy, and he named Eddie after his, uh, his favorite saint, Edward the Confessor. Now, this is a really weird saint to name your kid after, because Edward the Confessor, and Confessor in these days means that he like confessed his faith, he was really pious or whatever, but Edward the Confessor is best known for dying and being so inept at like establishing succession that there was this huge war over who was going to succeed him, uh, and that's the reason that William the Conqueror came over from France and like did the Norman Conquest. Edward almost died as a kid. He got super sick, but he managed to pull through, uh, and he grew into this towering behemoth of a man. He stood about six foot two inches tall at a time when most men were five five tops. Okay, so they had to make like custom armor for him, and he just beat the crap out of everybody in feats of strength, horsemanship, all of these other things that required you to just be bigger and stronger than everybody else around you. Uh, but he was also well read. He was super obsessed with the Knights of the Round Table. He thought King Arthur was like the most perfect king that ever lived, and and when Edward becomes king himself, he builds a Round Table to have his knights. 
Um, when he's 15, he ends up getting married to a woman he's never met before. And, and I say woman, but she was like 13. It was his second cousin. Uh, she was a Spanish princess named Eleanor of Castile. Uh, it's not that weird, especially among royals at this time, to marry somebody that's related to you. Second cousin's like as good as it's going to get. Um, because, you know, if you're a royal, you need to marry another royal. And there's only so many countries in Europe. And 300 years down the line, we're going to be dealing with hemophilia and all these other birth defects. But at the time, you know, this is just how things were done. Edward's father, Henry III, was a good man, but he was a weak king. He got pushed around a lot by the Pope and his wife's family and some of the nobles. And, uh, you know, he was mostly concerned with, like, rebuilding Westminster Abbey and taking care of his people and being very pious and doing what the church wanted. Uh, and at a certain point, there was a rebellion among the nobles. Like, they realized that he was weak, and when a king is weak, it means the nobility becomes strong and they get too big for their britches. And then uh, a guy named Simon de Montfort, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this correctly. I'm sure it's some French sounding like de Montfort or something, but uh, he rises up against Henry III in uh, 1260. Uh, Edward Longshanks is 25 at this time, and he is ready for fucking action. He is going to kick ass. He's the commander of the Royal Cavalry at the Battle of Luz in 1264. Eddie is chomping at the bit. He leads his army into battle. Like, he leads his the cavalry wing of the royal army into battle against the barons. And this is the first opportunity he's had to, like, swing a sword in anger. He just, he rides in, and, and his wing comes around, and they end up hitting the, uh, the levy spearmen, the peasant forces, you know, just, just the lowest, you know, the, the smallest, most inexperienced group of soldiers that uh, Simon de Montfort has in his army. And they just beat the... Those guys run before Edward even gets to him. And he's just whacking these dudes from his horse, you know, just beating the fucking piss out of these guys. They're running to the forest. He's riding them down. He chases them, you know, half a mile into the wilderness and just cutting down everybody he can. Uh, you know, he comes back. He decides, like, all right, we've, we've, whacked, we've whacked out enough of these guys. We're going to come back. When he comes back, uh, he returns to the battlefield, and he realizes that maybe his bloodlust got the better of him because the rest of the royal army got annihilated while he was gone. He comes back, and uh, de Montfort captures him. The royal army is defeated. The king has fled. And uh, now Edward Longshanks is a prisoner of Simon de Montfort. It's humiliating for the crown. Now... You have to look at this from Simon de Montfort's point of view. You can't throw... I mean, Edward Longshanks is the rightful heir to the English throne. You can't throw him in a dungeon. So he gets put under basically a house arrest, right? Like, he gets put in, like, a... You know, uh, he gets put up in a nice house. He's got all the amenities he needs. But he's got guards posted. It's like more like witness protection than, like, you know, the Tower of London. But, uh... Eddie slips his captors. He escapes gets back to royal lines and he is ready for fucking revenge i'm not even entirely sure that you need me to tell you how this story ends edward meets up with um a guy named roger mortimer and roger mortimer is going to get married to a woman named isabella the she-wolf of france who's fucking amazing and she's one of the most badass women in all of history i'm going to put a link to um my article about her down in the in the description below. You need to check her out. She's awesome. Uh, but, yeah, so he meets up with Roger Mortimer, and they go back, and they face De Montfort again, and it, they just fucking reins of Castamere his ass into the ground. Uh, they cut his nuts off, and I'm not, like, just saying, like, I'm not exaggerating about hyperbolizing. They literally cut his nuts off. They cut him open. They pull all of his guts out. They decapitate him. They massacre all the prisoners. They take no quarter. They fuck him up and that's the end of the rebellion. Now what Eddie takes away from the rebellion is that you can get your revenge but you don't need to be so impetuous about it. You can wait, you can bide your time, you can, you know, not let your bloodlust get the best of you. But anyway, he's still got more lessons to learn. He's still not king yet. His dad's still rebuilding the abbey, doing all of these other things. So he decides he's going to go out and join the Ninth Crusade when the Pope calls the Crusades. It's, the la it's one of the last of the Crusades, the last good crusade. He goes out uh, with about a thousand of his men, um, and they're going to go fight against Baibars, who is the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt. And Baibars is also fucking rad. I'm going to put a link to him down below because I've written about him before. Baibars was a slave soldier who ended up taking over and becoming Sultan of Egypt and, you know, conquering enough lands that they had to call a fucking crusade to come fight him. But 
Edward Longshanks joins that crusade, and uh, and he heads out. He lands uh, he lands in Acre, and he ends up attacking and capturing Nazareth, the homeland of Jesus Christ. And for him, this is a really big deal, especially because his dad is so pious. Uh, you know, he can't hold it. He ends up having to get rid of it because there's just there's no supply lines. The same reason all the crusades failed. And it's shortly after he captures Nazareth that he runs into that assassin that I was talking about earlier. This guy breaks into his tent in the middle of the night, shanks him in the back with a dagger coated with enough poison to kill any man. Uh, Edward Longshanks pulls the fucking dagger out of his own back, stabs the guy to death with it, just beats the shit out of him with it, and then his wife, who is, like I said, is also badass, she's on a fucking crusade with this guy, she sucks the poison out of his wound, spits it out, he survives. Right? But he's he's laid up. That's kind of the end of the crusade for him. You, you need a little bit of recovery time after having to deal with something like, you know, having a poison knife stuck in your back. So... He sails out. Uh, on the way back, he stops. Uh, he visits the Pope. He visits the King of France. And then he decides to head on home. And right before he gets home, he receives word that his father has died. And it's a double whammy because not only do you have, like, having to deal with your dad dying, but holy shit, now, what, I'm the king? In 1274... Edward I is crowned King of England in Westminster Abbey, which is a building that his own father spent his entire life redecorating in, like, this gothic style. Like, the, the style that it's in today. It hasn't been changed since he finished it. Um, he's crowned, and the moment that he's crowned, he takes the crown off, and he sets it down, and he says, um, he swears, he makes a vow to not put that crown back on until he's regained all the lands that his father lost from England. Shit's about to go down. Now the first target of Edward Longshank's wrath were the Welsh. And, you know, a lot of people in the United States kind of think of the Welsh as just being part of England, but we only think that because Edward Longshanks happened. Uh, before that, like, the Welsh are a real fucking intense group of people. They're intense kill like warriors they're bowmen they are like badass archers uh and you know edward longshanks demands fealty from their king a guy named llewellyn uh and it's the welsh it's it's an l-l-e-w llewellyn uh and i think that in the welsh language i'm under the impression that it's pronounced with some like back of the throat like a sound that i'm just never gonna be able to pronounce like a like a llewellyn kind of sound um for me I, i'm just gonna call him llewellyn which to me just sounds like, a, if I'm being totally honest, it kind of sounds like a trailer park wife. It sounds like a goddamn at Llewellyn, like where's my goddamn beer? But uh, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna roll with that. Anyway, Llewellyn's actually awesome. Llewellyn uh, says not only fuck you, Edward Longshanks, but he also finds Simon de Montfort's sister and uh, has her put on a ship to come to Wales to marry him, just to just as a fuck you to, like, to Edward Longshanks. Um, but he didn't really realize who he was fucking with. Edward Longshanks hired pirates to capture the ship before it reached Wales. She never made it. I don't know how her story ends. I wasn't able to find that out, like, on the amount of time that I had to research this article. Uh, I have no idea where that went, but... You don't fuck with Eddie Longshanks. He raised 15,000 footmen, 1,000 knights, and he marched on Wales with one of the biggest armies that England had ever seen. And he fucked them up. He blockaded them like by the sea. He attacked them on land. He burned down their castles. He killed uh, Llewellyn and Llewellyn's brother. Uh, he dug up, or he burned down the ancient burial grounds of the Welsh kings. He dug up a sword that he believed might have been King Arthur's sword. Like I said, he's really into that kind of stuff. Uh, he might have dug up King Arthur's sword, and he just burned everything else to the ground, and he built a fucking English castle on top of it. It's called Carnarvon. It's still there. Uh, and it's like one of the biggest like castles in... He modeled it after like some of the castles he'd seen in the Middle East while he was on the Crusades. Uh, it's one of the biggest castles in England. He built it on top of the ruins of Llewellyn's fucking army. And then, uh, yeah, he banged his uh, his wife there and had a kid who was going to be the future, you know, King Edward II, and he decided, I'm going to call him Prince of Wales. And from that moment on, every future king of England is called the Prince of Wales, like, to this day.
Now, I'm not going to get too much into this, but Edward Longshanks was also a capable administrator of his kingdom. He'd seen a rebellion in his lifetime, and he didn't want to have to deal with that again. So he starts setting up, uh, he sets up, you know, his cabinet, which has already existed. It's like kings have had cabinets forever, but he set one up, and he said, uh, you know, I want to, um, I want all of the people of my kingdom to realize that if they have a problem, they can go to the, my group of, my my cabinet, and you can ask them, you petition, whatever you need. He was like, I can't always guarantee I'm going to make you happy or give you what you need, but you shouldn't be afraid to ask me for what you want. And uh, and they did. And if you go to the Wikipedia page for Parliament, Parliament basically began with Edward Longshanks in the way that we know it today. Yeah, I mean, sure, he, like, taxed the fuck out of his people, but it was because he had to, like, pay for all of these wars. But it was the beginning of self-government. And he also set up, uh, he got rid of anybody that was corrupt in his government. He got rid of all of the corrupt sheriffs, all of the corrupt, like, local politicians. If there was somebody that was taking money on the side for something else or, or doing shady shit, he kicked them out and he replaced them with a guy that he could trust. In 1290, Edward's queen dies. She's related to him, sure, but he was crazy romantic for her. They had 15 kids. 15 fucking kids. Uh, they'd been married for 36 years, and uh, when she died, uh, she was 49 years old, and he was just heartbroken. He couldn't deal. Um, he had her body transported across England, and uh, it's one of these old days where, you know, you have to... You, you, you have to make these like short journeys every day and every place that her funeral carriage stopped between Carnarvon and London where she was buried in Westminster Abbey um, he had a huge tower built engraved with all of this like religious iconography um, so he had these 12 things built these 12 crosses for his wife um, he'd get married again but it wouldn't be like a, until like a decade later and he would keep fathering kids his his second wife was like a french princess and she was like 18 and he was like 60 and he just kept banging out kids like i don't know it's kind of gross but I, I really feel like there's a long shanks joke to be made here that it's just eluding me at the moment anyway the point is that after his wife dies He's got nothing left to lose, and oh yeah, it just so happens that a year after his wife dies, um, there happens to be a succession problem in Scotland. You've got 13 claimants to the throne. The most legitimate one was a six-month-old girl who died. And uh, in 1291, they call him to come figure it out. So he picks a guy named uh, John Bailiot. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Probably not, but... Uh, he figures that John is the weakest of the candidates for the throne, so he wants to have this guy be in charge, and he wants to be the guy that he owes the throne to, and he just figures he can like just work this guy over and treat him as a puppet. Um, well, John Bailiot is a puppet, but he's not a puppet for the King of England. He's a puppet for the nobility of Scotland, and... Uh, they don't like Edward Longshanks because the Scots and the English, I don't know if this is a news flash for you, but they don't get along that well all the time. So, uh, it goes on the warpath. And it ends really, really fucking badly for Scotland. Now, we did a little primer on the Welsh, but I don't think I need to prime you on why the Scots are badass. Uh, I'm just going to assume that this is common knowledge at this point. Uh, so in March of 1296, Edward Longshanks heads into, uh, into Scotland with the intent of conquering the land. Uh, he besieges this town called Berwick. It's right on the, it's right on the, the border. Um, he surrounds them, and they just start throwing shit from the walls. It's very, like, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know, they're just, they're insulting him, they're yelling out things from the walls, they're tied in, and by all accounts, not only does Edward Longshanks personally lead the attack, he's 57 years old in full fucking plate armor in 12 goddamn 96, he jumps the moat on his horse, which he's named after a very famous uh, French knight called Bayard, um, leaps the frickin' moat and, uh, and charges in first of the army into the battle. Uh, and he just, I mean, they, they red wedding this fucking town. They take the town and they murder every man, woman, child, every single human being they can get their hands on is put to the sword. And, and that's Edward Longshanks for you. You know, like, he's not a 
He's not a good guy. He's a badass. It's a very different thing. I, I you know, it's a very different. It, I, you need to make a distinction on that when you're talking about this kind of stuff. Um, and here's a here's a good example of that. Is that uh, he? Um, you know, like I said earlier, the Jews hate him, and for very good reason. Uh, and and this isn't this isn't cool or any of that stuff. But like, and it's not just because anti-Semitism was like a big thing in the Middle Ages, and especially like among Christian kingdoms. Uh, he realized at a certain point he'd been fighting all of these wars, and he realized that uh, he was in debt to a lot of people, and he realized that everybody that he owed money to were Jewish moneylenders, and the Jewish moneylenders were only in that business because. Catholic society forbade them from doing basically anything other than being moneylenders. Uh, but he realized that he owed money to these people, so he just expelled them all from this kingdom. And, and that was it. And, uh, I don't know. It's like, uh, it's ballsy, you know? It is. I'm gonna tie it into Game of Thrones again, um, and I'm gonna say that, uh, I'm gonna link it in... Uh, Here's how I'm gonna do it. There was a there's a great video that I'm, I'm gonna link to in the description below, and um, it's a uh, they're interviewing actors and actresses from Game of Thrones talking about the Red Wedding. I'm not gonna spoil this for anybody who hasn't seen it yet, but like basically like they're all breaking character. They're all talking about it as their actors, and they're saying, oh, you know, it's so so horrible, so you know, it was brutal. I you know, it was hard to watch. Da 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 da. And then in the middle of this. They go to Charles Dance, who plays Tywin Lannister, who is the guy that Edward Longshanks is based off of. And I'm just going to clip this in because this is Edward Longshanks to a T. Tywin is just doing what he has to do. It's a feudal society that he lives in, and he has to retain his position. And um, he can only do that from being strong and ruthless. So, yeah, that's that. Edward Longshanks takes all of Scotland. He stampedes his fucking army through Scotland, beats the shit out of everybody, uh, takes their capital, and then he takes um, the Stone of Schoon, I think it's pronounced, um, which is the ancient, like, rock. It's a big rock, but, like, it's what the Scottish kings are crowned on. Any Scottish king is sits on this rock when they're crowned. Uh, and he takes it, and he brings it back to England, and he puts it under his throne in Westminster Abbey. He says, fuck it, you guys are part of me now, and uh, we're doing this. And uh, to this day, the stone is under his throne that he built in Westminster Abbey. The Scots built a reproduction of it. Because that's the best they're going to do. Because of fucking Edward Longshanks. This is Scotland. So... Let's not start sucking each other's dicks just yet because a new challenger appears and his name is William motherfucking Wallace. Now the English have done pretty well against the Scottish up to this point, but when they attack at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, they get half the fucking heavy cavalry gets across the bridge, they get swarmed, and then William Wallace's guys bring the bridge down. They annihilate half the fucking English heavy cavalry in one day. I've written about William Wallace a bunch of times in the books and uh, on the website. You need to um, check that out. Uh, I'm going to put a link down below. Um, but they just beat the crap out of the English. So if Edward Longshanks wants to deal with this and he wants to get a really awesome nickname like the Hammer of the Scots, he's going to have to deal with this personally. Edward Longshanks assembles his forces and he attacks back into Scotland a second time. He marches in, this time on William Wallace, and by, by this point, William Wallace has not only retaken all of Scotland from England, but he's marched down into England. But it's gonna take more than that to, like, scare away Edward Longshanks. So Edward Longshanks attacks at the Battle of Falkirk, uh, and what he runs into is um, basically the strategy that you see in Braveheart. It's called the Shiltron. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but you get a bunch of wooden stakes, and you it's, it's basically forming a square. If you've seen that in, like, the old Napoleonic stuff, like, a horse won't charge into a, its own death. So if you're charging with heavy cavalry and you get a row of spears up, uh, even if they're, like, crappy wooden spears, a horse isn't gonna charge into that. You can't, you can't make a horse commit suicide for you uh, and I don't think you'd really want to anyway uh, but he runs into that and he can't he can't penetrate his heavy cavalry which is like 
the guys that he's you know his he, they got chainmail, they got heavy plate, they've got all the big lances, all of this stuff, but they can't break through William Wallace's defenses, this Shieldtron at Falkirk, uh, and they they fall back. But then Edward Longshanks calls in like his heavy artillery, and remember when I was talking about how the Welsh were badass? Uh, well, they had that longbow, and uh, they have a Welsh longbow, and it shoots a uh, you know exceptional distance, punches through any kind of armor. He brought up his Welshmen, who were very loyal to King Edward Longshanks now, and they just sat back and just just sniped the Shiltron to pieces. The British win Falkirk. They crush the Scottish forces. William Wallace escapes, but he's later sold out by his own Scottish nobles. Um, I'm sure you've seen the movie. Uh, so they bring him back to Edward Longshanks, and Edward Longshanks devises a new form of medieval execution, which, when you think about the Inquisition and, you know, trial by ordeal and all of these other horrible things that medieval people were able to do to other people without even thinking about it, in order to come up with a new method of execution and torture, it's pretty impressive. So Edward Longshanks uh, devises a method of execution called being hanged, drawn, and quartered. And what that means is they hang you, like from a noose, but not they don't just drop it out so it breaks your neck. They, uh, they hang you and just choke the fuck out of you, and then they cut you down before you die. Then they cut open your body, uh, and they pull out all your guts, and they set them all on fire in the town square. Then they cut you into pieces. They cut your head off, your arms, legs. And uh, in William Wallace's case, Longshanks put the head uh, on the Tower of London, which is also what he did with Simon de Montfort's head, by the way. Uh, he put them next to each other. And then he took the body parts, and uh, and it's worth mentioning that this is like 50 years after de Montfort died. Uh, he takes the body parts of William Wallace, and he sends them to different towns in Scotland that supported the rebellion. They don't like this, of course. They rise up again immediately after like seeing all of this under a guy named Robert the Bruce, who's one of the greatest like heroes in Scottish history. So is William Wallace. Like these two guys are the reason that Scotland is a free country, but they're not a free country because Edward Longshanks let them be a free country. Edward Longshanks marches back in. He's going to attack um, Robert the Bruce. He's going to fuck him up. He marches in. He's already marched the biggest army the England has ever seen into Wales. He's got an, he's already beat his own record and he's gonna march that army. Welsh longbowmen, like yeoman archers, fucking every kind of heavy cavalry you can think of, every kind of foot soldier. He marches them all into Scotland, so because he's gonna fuck Robert the Bruce up. And uh, right as he's about to cross the border, um, he dies. He's 69 years old, which is nice, and uh, he passes away of dysentery. You know, he's an old man. He's lucky he lived to be 69 in these days. And so he, um, on his deathbed, uh, his final words, and there's some debate about this. Uh, they were either that he be strapped to a chair like El Cid and marched out at the front of his army, or that he be boiled, his dead body be boiled, and all of the skin pulled off of it, and then his skeleton be marched out with the crown still on it. So if you're ever looking for, like, a good D&D quest idea, this is probably, like your opportunity to take advantage of this. Um, so he decides he's going to, uh, he wants that, but his son is just not from the same genetics of him. You know, like his son just immediately, he's got this huge army, the largest army England has ever seen, and he's about to take them into Scotland. And as soon as Edward I dies, Edward II becomes king, and he heads back to Westminster Abbey to be crowned and consolidate his power. And by the time he comes back, it's a good, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's five to ten years, and Robert the Bruce just kicks the shit out of Edward II. So, um, Edward I, he dies in Scotland, and he uh, is buried in Westminster Abbey, the place his dad built. He was buried next to his wife, um, and his epitaph says, Here lies Edward, Hammer of the Scots. I think it's an epitaph that we can all aspire to.
All right, guys, thanks for making it to this point in the video. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you bearing with me on this. Uh, just let me know what you thought. Like, if you liked it, let me know. If you don't ever want me to do anything like this again, let me know. Um, I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on it. It's something different and new and exciting and crazy that I wanted to try. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, anyway, as always, I appreciate all of your support, and uh, I'll see you next week.